So I'm going to talk to you today um, a little bit about what we heard earlier, which was um, from operators and from the contractors, how important it is to work in collaboration across the supply chain uh, for, for benefits to, to, to everyone. Uh, I'm obviously going to introduce the company um, and then talk about our product, printed circuit heat exchangers, how they work in operation, uh, and then talk predominantly about how to help our customers maximize uptime uh, with a little case study to, uh, to bring some of the examples home. Okay. And if this all goes well, there's some really dirty photos at the end. That might make more sense when we get there. Okay, uh, we're part of Megit, um, so a two billion pound group that specializes in aerospace, defense, and energy. But the Heatrick division is based in sunny Dorset uh, in, in Poole, where all the design, manufacturing, and support takes place. We've been principally the inventor of, well, we are the, the inventor of the PCHE concept, uh, and for over 25 years we've been supplying, uh, coming up to uh, over 2,500 heat exchangers, uh, a lot of them. Um, into the FPSO market, and I'll try and explain why that is later. But um, why, why would you want a printed circuit heat exchanger? I guess there's, there's three predominant factors that come to the fore. Uh, thermal performance, uh, the mechanical capabilities, and superior safety and integrity. Um, for FPSOs and any asset or platform that has space restrictions, the, this is where the PCHE technology really comes into its own. This is a comparison of a shell and tube with the, uh, the PCHEs, and you can see that there's something equivalent to a, a, an 80% reduction in size and associated weight. And where space is, a, is an issue and a premium, clearly that's where the PCHE uh, makes sense, and, and that's been one of our key uh, capabilities into our customers. The other one is um, actually the, the ability to, to work in much higher pressures and temperatures up to, uh, we're sort of edging beyond 1,000 bar and edging towards 1,000 degrees in terms of the ability to operate under those conditions. Okay, uh, so how is a PCHE constructed? So the first process is um, etching the various plates which are then stacked together and diffusion bonded which forms a core and then those cores themselves are welded together and then we assemble the other elements headers nozzles nozzles and flanges and uh, complete the PCHE Some of the benefits, um, not susceptible to vibration. Uh, compared to some of the other technologies, no braze or gaskets. Uh, what, but one of the key things is that there's no catastrophic failure. So there's, there's no failure mode where we see uh, an external excursion, which is quite important given the environments we operate in. And of course, we provide a whole suite of support services, as you'd expect. Um, and this is where the presentation sort of takes a little bit of a, a, a turn. So I've introduced the company. But one of the things that I've been with the company six months, and one of the things I noticed when I came in is that um, we, we have obviously, we sell the equipment and we support the equipment, and we get revenue from the support work that we do. Um, but what's important to us is that the customer actually has a good experience with the, with the PCHE. And um, you'll see in the rest of the slides where we think we can do more, to help customers have a better experience and get greater uptime. Uh, but that means that we also have to have a deeper relationship with the operators. And that's really what this is all about. So it's great that we've got all these support services when things go wrong or, or needs um, some form of maintenance. But really what we're all about is trying to reduce that burden. And the philosophy is, as I said, that if we get that right, then the PCHE itself becomes a more uh, attractive product. And of course, we, uh, we provide to a lot of the, uh, 
usual suspects in this industry. Okay. Always good to get rid of the introduction of a business, huh? Get onto the main, main slides. Right. Um, statistically, the PCHEs can, uh, would have about 0 0.02 failure per year, which equates to 57 years of operation. And that's our analysis, and of course, uh, we all know about statistics. Um, and one of the reasons behind that is, is that when, it, when you look at the different failure modes that we can have for heat exchangers compared to shell and tube, there's really only three that, uh, that PCHEs have around thermal fatigue, corrosion, and blockage or fouling. I think this is where it gets quite interesting because we started to have a look at what those failure mechanisms are. And 80%, 80% of the issues around some form of thermal cycling, be that in terms of the coolant boiling or the process control, with only 1% of those issues causing anything that goes into the atmosphere. And that's normally due to some form of corrosion. So when I look at that and I think, well, okay, that's, that's the area that we should really start thinking of focusing on. How can we help customers not have those issues? I, I, had to, um, I had to change this slide because it said poor system design. And I thought that was a bit, a bit harsh of us to say the customers got their design wrong. But what it really is about is that there are design issues that are leading to over 80% of those failures. So if they're design issues, that means that they can be addressed. And I think it means that we have to be a little bit more transparent than perhaps we've been before around those failure mechanisms and allow our customers to understand where the issues could arise. So this is one of the curves that we have in terms of our own understanding of our equipment. And it's to do with looking at what the temperature amplitude is and number of cycles so that we can give a prediction of when the um, thermal fatigue may or may not happen. And you'll see that as long as you stay between um, a sort of 10 to 40 degree change in amplitude, the PCHEs are gonna, are gonna last for a lot of cycles. And actually they're quite tolerant of bigger changes in amplitude, but it cl clearly that has an effect on the number of cycles. But the, the issue here is that if we can have a discussion with the engineers at the early stage, we can start modeling when those fatigues could be an issue and start get, having that consultative discussion around potential issues early enough. And the failures look like this. So this is um, thermal fatigue or pitting corrosion. And you'll see that, that, that they sort of start with very small cracks and leaks into different channels, but nothing, as I said earlier, no catastrophic failure. It's a very different failure mode. It's a sort of soft failure, and you can pick it up quite quickly. And that's important. So how can we work together? Well, as I said earlier, we had on the stage people that represented the EPCs, people that present maybe the yards or the owners, and frankly, they're, they're driven by different things in the, in the, in the life cycle. Um, and and maybe, maybe it's about really trying to understand that really what we're trying to do is that the owner space add value and make sure they get a good experience with the PCHE, which is about uptime. So how can we support them in the design phase? How can we support them in the installation and commissioning, and then support during operation. These are the things that we're saying would be great to have more proactive conversations around so that we can prevent any issues from happening. So early in the design phase, looking at the P&ID diagrams, we, we may be a PCHE supplier here, but actually we've got a lot of people that really understand the process as well. And after doing two and a half thousand of these, we've got some really good knowledge about things to be aware of in that process. And there's no reason why we shouldn't have collaboration around sharing that knowledge. So a few things that need to be done to prevent unstable coolant boiling. This might get a bit techy, but really it's about managing your, your system design pressure and uh, doing something around blanketing on the, the header tank so that you've got the pressure and actually monitoring that pressure, having the control and instrumentation so you're aware of what's going on and associated alarms. Now, it's not rocket science, by the way, but those figures 
about 50% of failures say that something's going wrong in the whole engagement, that these issues are still happening. Um, to avoid unstable process control, where we're seeing huge transients, which isn't good for any mechanical piece of equipment, it's actually sort of restricting the movement of the control valve and actually maybe getting some feedback from that valve as well to see what it's doing. And that feedback needs to be quite quick because obviously that can flutter at quite a high frequency. And then to avoid some of the, the fouling that happens, um, obviously fitting strainers and, and measuring the differential pressure at the appropriate places in the system. And then also making sure in the design phase that we've got the, uh, the system monitoring the relevant areas and setting alarms appropriately. So in terms of installation and commissioning phase, uh, and this is the statistic that somewhat blew me away, as I said when I joined, is that half of the fouling issues with PCHEs happen during startup and commissioning. So what, what we have is, is, is a situation where we, we were trying to brainstorm, how can we stop people using the, the PCHE as a filter, connecting it all up and flushing all kinds of debris and uh, various other uh, chemicals, et cetera, into the PCHE before it's even begun life? And, and we, we had a brainstorm and we came up with some silly ideas, uh, everything from putting stickers on that actually you can't open this until you dial this number and we can explain things were happening. But this is the sort of thing that we want to try and get across to our customers that you know, we don't want you to use the PCHE as a, fil excuse me, as a filter. And just to emphasize the point, these are the kind of things that we end up finding inside the PCHEs, huge pieces of debris that really shouldn't be there. And of course, if you have something that size, it's blocking lots of the channels. And before you've even started, it's reducing the performance of the, of the equipment. Again, another example where one of the um, strainers had burst. All of those elements, all that debris in the strainer, in the, sorry, in the PCHE for life until it gets cleaned out. So quite a few things to do in the commissioning phase. I won't read all of these out, but it's really just good practice. It's just making sure that good practice is happening at the commissioning phase. And we've offered, and we do offer, to have engineers on site to support, but sometimes that, that offer isn't taken up for whatever reason, and then we see the consequence, perhaps, of not having that oversight. Uh, support during operations as well, so when the unit's in operation, looking at the trending data, if we start to see the pressure drop rising, making sure that we can support the customer to try and understand why, why is that happening. And here it would be analysis of, actually, this is the percentage of channels that you have blocked, and this is the effect it's happening on your thermal performance and your pressure drop. Um, and therefore, you can use that to then start predicting, can they carry on? And for how long? And that's important because we, you know, we're not saying as soon as the PCHE gets blocked to any degree, you need to do something like clean it or replace it. What we're saying is you can have, you apply some intelligence to know when to make those decisions. And we also, of course, can help with setting up the various I.O. points that you should be monitoring through, um, through the life. Okay, um, here's an example of, of where we've had those collaborative conversation and, and it's helped the customer. And this is in terms of high pressure water jetting. So typically, um, we use UHP cleaning, ultra high pressure cleaning, about every two to three years. We had a customer that was suffering uh, fouling because of an additive in their gas stream. Um, they tried a chemical clean they approached us and said, actually, we need to recall. Very expensive process for the customer. When we looked at it, we did some analysis. These are the dirty photos I said I'd show you later. Um, when we looked at this, um, this is the kind of condition of the internals of the heat exchanger. And our recommendation, based on our experience, was that actually you can do some UHP water jetting instead of re recalling. 
quite a significant differential in price. So we took the heat exchanger back, did some testing in terms of pre-flow testing, and then did tests, flow tests after an 8, 14, and 21 hour intervals. So that's the curve as we received. This is the curve as you'd expect. This is actually calculated. New PCHEs tend to be a little bit better. So after eight hours, before, after, so significant improvement anyone can see. But most importantly, you can start to see that curve getting back into the right place after just eight hours. And then 14 hours, and then 21 hours. So you're into a law of diminishing returns here. So at that point, the customer said, okay, clean enough. We've got the performance back. And again, just some photos that emphasize this is the conditions inside the PCHE before and after, before and after. So the cleaning, when you do the right approach to cleaning and the right type of cleaning, can really bring the PCHE back to life. But it requires engagement. It requires an open discussion about what's going wrong. It can also require a conversation about process conditions and being honest about how you're running the plant. But as you can see, after 24, 21 hours, less than 5% of the channel's blocked. So, our reason Detra is about trying to maximize uptime for customers. Yes, we've got those support services, but I, my point is that if we can have that collaboration early enough in the design phase, then we can design out a lot of these issues. And at the point of design, commissioning, and operation, there's a lot that companies like us can do if we're allowed access and open discussions. Thank you very much.